take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Give you just a second to find it. <clears throat> Revelation 20. Jason, you can go to the end of the Bible and take a left and you'll be there in just a little bit, okay? So good to see you here today. One of the most asked questions among us <laughs> is, why do bad things happen to good people? I mean, we like that. We want to know the answer to that question. And probably you've asked it. Probably you've heard people ask it. There have been books written about it. Why do bad things happen to good people? When I hear that question, it impacts me a little different than most. Because I take the two things there that jump out at me. Bad things and good people. Bad things and good people. So let's talk about the good people first. And before I unpack this, I'm just going to tell you that there are some people that are my friends that will be glad when I leave New Hope Baptist Church. Because they're tired of hearing me brag about what good people are in the church and on the creek. Good people. But when I look at that term, good people, I'm reminded of Mark and Luke's recording of the life of Jesus. And somebody came to Jesus and said, good teacher. And then asked him a question. And he goes, he kind of bristled at that. And he goes, why do you call me good? Nobody's good except God. And you go, well, he's the son of God. He was good. Well, yeah. But what he was trying to do, he was trying to do for them and by extension to us that we see this thing of good people through the eyes of God instead of our own standard, through the eyes of the Scripture instead of our own judgments. For instance, the Bible tells us that there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So you know what that tells us? Left to our own, we're not going to be a good people. Left to our own, we are sinful and wretched. Good people. Bad things. Okay, if I were to ask you, where do bad things, evil things, hurtful things come from? Everybody in unison would just about say, Satan, the devil, Lucifer, the fallen angel. Because that's where we know it came from. And I'll concede, I'll concede that evil things come from this being. But you have to concede that Satan probably slithered around in the garden as the evil one long before evil acts entered the world. For you see, he was here, but he was not up. He didn't have a path. He did not have a way to get his evil into the world until God's crown creation, mankind, the first couple, opened a door for him to bring his evil into this world. And here's what's happened. Teenagers, I hope you'll hear this, is that since the Garden of Eden, since we let him in, Evil runs rampant. And evil, bad things, are no respecter of persons. If I were to ask you to raise your hand if you ever had a hurt or heartache, sickness, suffering, everybody in this room, if you're honest, would raise your hand. Because now we live in this fallen world, this world that, where evil things happen, and it rains on the just and the unjust alike. But then, in the context of history, then Jesus stepped out of eternity into time so to make a way for you and I to step out of time into eternity. He came to overcome the death and the darkness, the sickness that's around us. You see, the 
the truth is, when he stepped out of time into, into eternity, he came to move us, to move us, to capture our heart, because he knew that we were moving toward eternity. And that's the title of the message today, Moving Toward Eternity. He, Jesus, is the blessed hope that literally takes away the evil, takes away the hurt, takes away the pain. He's in the process of doing that today so that we can move into eternity and enjoy eternity, that we can have eternal life as opposed to eternal death. Those are your two options. I want to say that again. Those are your two options, eternal life or eternal death. If we're going to enjoy eternity, three things must happen. Number one, Satan has to be done away with. Number two, sinners, those who are outside of Jesus, must be dealt with. And number three, saints, those of us who have given our hearts to the Lord, have to be identified. When I read the Revelation I'm from, from chapter 1 to chapter 22, and when you read the Revelation, if you're human, it brings mixed emotions. It brings joy. It brings sorrow. It brings excitement. It brings regret. It brings encouragement. And it brings sadness. And your emotions about what it brings to you is directly related to your relationship to the Lord Jesus. If it's not about you, it's about your friends and your loved one. Because when you get to where we are in the scripture today, you understand that there are only two roads, two ways, two gates. And I just want to say this to you. Whether you're the tough, whether you're the tough guy, no offense, Colin. Whether you're the tough game of basketball, whether you are a person that's given your life to your work, it doesn't matter who you are, every one of us is moving toward eternity. You can't stop it. All you can do is make preparations for it. As we look at chapter 20, we're going to see this kind of jump off the page. If you have your Bibles open, and you can, we're going to read the entire 15 verses. Let's stand to honor the reading of God's holy word. <clears throat> John writes and he says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key, not a key, it's not been duplicated, the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, took hold, laid hold of the dragon, that ancient servant, serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him in the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until a thousand years were completed. After that, he must be released for a short time. Then... I saw thrones. Now, this is not one. This is many. And people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or the image and who had not accepted the mark on their forehead or their hand. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, and, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations at the, 
four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They came up across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city, that would be Jerusalem. Then fire came from heaven, came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and suffer where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented night and day forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and one on it, one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by what is written in the books. Then the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each one was judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not writ, found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> You have given us such a moving word about the future of your creation. I pray that we will I pray that we will listen. I pray that we'll respond. I pray that your spirit moves over this place. And whatever words I might speak wrong, you would speak them right. Speak to our hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The 20th chapter of Revelation offers us three snapshots that I want to bring to your attention today. Three snapshots of what I call the final audit, the final judgment are simply final things because this is final. The first thing that I see here begins in verse 1. This is what has to happen. We see the defeat of Satan. The defeat of Satan. Now, I don't know about you. I know this is heavy material. But I kind of like the sound of the defeat of Satan. Amen. I mean, I want you to think about it. The fallen angel, the fallen angel who has slithered into the garden, he deceived the first couple, he deceived Eve, he brought sin into the, into the world, he brought death, he brought heartache, he brought headache into the world. The one who's responsible for all the bad that happens to good people. Here's the deal. Right here, he's, go, he's getting bound and he's going down. I don't know about you, but I kind of get excited about that. In fact, I wish the angel would come on and do it today. This is what he says. It says, the angel came down from heaven. He has not many keys, but he has one key. There's no duplicate. Has a key in his hand, maybe around his neck because he's got a chain in the other hand. And he seizes, he lays hold to, to, the, uh, um, to Satan himself. He lays hold to him, puts him in the abyss. He closes the door, he locks it, he even puts a seal on it for a thousand years. Is anybody like that? Why doesn't he just come do that today and get us out of trouble? That's my question. But here's what I want to tell you. Already, the false prophet, you can read the previous chapter, the false prophet, 
and the beast have been thrown into the lake of fire, and now Satan has been thrown into the abyss. It's kind of like God is cleaning house. He's had enough, and he's going to clean house. Jesus has been revealed. Satan has been bound. Evil for a time has been eradicated. And the millennial reign of Christ begins a thousand years. This would be what we all want. I want you to think about it. During the millennial reign of Christ, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, there is no war. It's peace. The lion and the lamb will lay down with each other because they're at peace with one another. Lifespans during that millennial reign will, continue, will go, start back to how it was in the Old Testament. You remember when they lived several hundred years? And everything seems to be okay until the thousand years complete. After the thousand years, the pit will be opened and the deceiver once again will be released. Most asked question at this point in the scripture that I get as a pastor is, why in the world does God do this? This morning, Brother Kevin came in the office. I said, I want to ask you a question. I, put, I pitched that one to him, and he goes, I don't have a clue. And I can tell you, we don't have a clue because we are told. And, and, and we're not told. It, and, and I have read people a lot smarter than me that don't have a clue why he releases them. I just offer you a couple of thoughts. Is that perhaps God wants to test those who still remain here that have trusted him. Maybe he wants to trust their, test their faith. Maybe, maybe he brings them back because he really wants to show everybody once and for all that he is indeed God. Why do, I, why do I say something like that? Because when I look at verse 8 and 9, you find the destruction of Satan in, in verses 1 through 3 and 7 through 10. But when you look at verses 8 and 9, you walk away with the, with the idea that Satan is really an arrogant hard head. In fact, in fact, I would suggest to you that Satan seems to, when, he, when he's let out of the abyss, it seems to me that maybe he thinks that he escaped. Maybe he thinks he outsmarted God, and he's going to gather everybody who will follow him and going to attack the holy city. And you read here in verse 9 and 10, God said, okay, I'll stop this. And this time God doesn't send an angel with a key and a chain. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of that time that church was in such trouble. <laughs> and they were all at the altar. They'd been driven to their knees at the altar. And they were wailing and praying. And one, one man said, God, we need Elijah. We need Moses. We need Noah. We need Daniel. Send somebody. And the lady next to him said, Lord, we don't need anybody else. We need you. Come yourself. You see, the truth is, is that this time, God doesn't send an angel. He comes himself <coughs> to finish Satan off. As I was preparing this message, something came to my mind. And I want you to think about it. You've never thought about it before. Can you imagine God's frustration with and disappointment in Lucifer, the one we call Satan. Excuse me. I mean, I want you to think about this. Ezekiel 28 tells us that God created the one we know as Lucifer, the devil, Satan, God created him. Not only did he create him, he created him <clears throat> the most beautiful, the most talented, many, many think the most powerful. When you think about all that God bestowed on this one that was called Lucifer, he invested a lot in this one. It's everything that People could want beauty, 
talent, power. <clears throat> and the Bible tells us, kind of like us sometimes, the Bible tells us that he became arrogant, he became violent, he became literally uncontrollable. <clears throat> and because of that, God kicked him out of heaven. He, in his proud, corrupt, violent way, was kicked out of heaven in disgrace. And so you say, well, why didn't, why didn't God go ahead and just destroy him? Why did he send him down here to cause us so much problem? This is one of these many questions that we don't know the exact answer to. We'll have to ask God in heaven if, if it's still important when we get there. I was thinking about that this week. <clears throat> why, when God kicked him out of heaven, why did he just take care of him? Could it be <clears throat> that the God that we know as merciful and loving, the God of salvation, was wanting Lucifer to come to his senses and repent and return, and so he's given him space. Now listen, don't go tell anybody that I teach in this is theology. I'm just thinking. But here's what I will tell you us, the, the impact for us. We should, be, we should be reminded that God is a God of mercy and love and grace and salvation. But we should be reminded that his patience will run out. Because here, in verse 10, he eradicates Satan once and for all. He puts him in the lake of fire to burn those last words forever and ever. The defeat of Satan. The second thing that we need to, second little picture snapshot that I see is move from the defeat of Satan to the display of the saints. To the display of saints. I mean, this is found in verses four through six. This is like the coronation of all of those who have followed Jesus. The scripture begins in that verse and it says, Then I saw thrones, many thrones, and on those thrones were the saints, those who have been martyred, beheaded is actually the word. People who sat on those thrones were given authority to judge. And that probably... Uh, rubs some of us the wrong way, but there is, in Scripture there is, a, there is always a connection between if you suffer with Christ, you will reign with Christ. These guys were given authority. Authority. <laughs> I just read that word and I thought, man, that's not a word that people won't use today. You know what authority is? <clears throat> it's what our teenagers hate. Because they hate somebody Listen to me. Hate somebody to tell you what to do, where to go, and I'll nod at me there, Jude. That's a good, honest answer. Hate it. Teenagers hate it. But teenagers, can I just give you a little encouragement today? You know why you hate it? Because it's genetic. Because your mom and dad hated it when they were your age. Could I get an amen? Because they didn't want anybody telling them what to do. It's human nature. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Authority is required. If you're going to have, if you're going to have a society, if you're going to have a civil society, there must be authority. Now let me, let me, let me just kind of run on this because we're, we're in a culture that's trying to do away with authority. <clears throat> If you're an atheist, if we have an atheist among us, welcome. If you're an atheist, you don't have any, nobody's got any authority. There are no objective truths. There are no objective rules. And so uh, um, 
Basically, let me, give, let me just be crass to tell you how far this plays down. So, if we have no rules, if nobody's got authority, I can go right there and I can kill Jason Stringer. Renee can get mad and she'd go, we're going to arrest you and put you in jail. And I go, you don't have any authority to arrest me. There's no authority. Nothing says what's right and wrong if you don't have authority. I had an opportunity to tell a friend of mine this one time. He professed to not believe the Bible. And I said, do you make it up as you go? He had a beautiful 16, 17-year-old daughter. And I said, so here's what I'm going to tell you. If you don't have, if no, nobody's telling you what right and wrong is, and Jessica decides to leave home and go, and go shack up with a boy, you have no grounds to tell her it's wrong. He said, well, that's mine. I said, well, if it's objective, you don't, there's no grounds. You see, authority is what puts the side planks on society. Today, in our culture, we are trying to remove authority. That's why we see everybody running wild. You can find it two times in the book of Judges. If you want to find it easily, it's the last verse of the book of Judges. It's where we are today. And in those days, there was no king, or you can put God there, in all of Israel, in all of the United States, so everybody did what was right in their own mind. That's what it means to not have authority. Walked into Jimmy and Pudge's class a few months ago, and they were talking about this truth. Right is right if nobody does it. Wrong is wrong if everybody does it. Here's what I want to say to you. Like it or not, according to this book, right, wrong, good, and godly are not majority rules items. There are things that our Lord Jesus has put in place. You see, these folks were given the authority to judge from the Word of God, from the heart of God. They had been saved, and now they had crowns, and they were on thrones, and there's something, please listen, there's something connected in the Bible about suffering and thrones, <laughs> suffering and reigning. I just will say this, suffering is not coming to service when the air conditioning's out. That's not, that may be uncomfortable, but that's not suffering. Suffering is when you are called on the carpet for no other reason than because of your faith. When you are mistreated because of your faith. In verses 4 through 6, where we see this display of all these people, some of them brought back to life, have the privilege of reigning with Jesus, literally thousands on display. But then we get to the heart of this chapter. After we see the display, the defeat of Satan, the display of the saints, we end with the death of sinners. <laughs> Ten days ago, Brother Bob Pittman, without warning to me, stood up and read Revelation 20. Verses 11 through 15, and I about swallowed my Adam's apple because I knew how good he communicates the truth. And I knew that on this day that I was to be in Revelation 20. He did his good job. Amen? Amen. And I pray that you'll remember, if you were there, I pray you'll remember his words as well as hang on to these today. I'm going to divide these verses into three very simple parts. The picture, the people, and the place. The picture, the people, and the place. It's not going to be on the screen. I'm just going to tell you. So first of all, I want you to see this. I want you to see this picture. It says right there, then I saw a great white throne. Not many throne. It's a great. It's a big. It's a white throne. And there is one person on it. No longer are there many thrones. No longer are the saints held up. We see the Lord Jesus, none other, sitting on the throne. Can you see that in your mind's eye? And then according to the scripture, we see the books brought out. The books are brought out. 
And these books are the books that contain everything that everyone there has done. Did you hear that? There's a book with everything you've done. And you know what happens at the, judge, at the great white throne? Everything written in those books are like put up on a screen. What's hidden here is revealed there. And, and, so, and so everybody sees what everyone has done. Oh, but then, hang on to this picture. Those books are brought out. But then a special book is brought out. And I would describe this in our 21st century as a book that's a ledger book. It's a spreadsheet. And there's not a lot of things written in that book. The only thing that's written are names. Are names. And the truth is, your name today is either written there or it's not. And for everyone who stands before the great white throne, none of their names are written there. In biblical language, they are there in the presence of Jesus. Oh, by the way, I thought Bob made a good point about this. Our scripture says, and they tried to escape. They tried to flee from his presence. The old translations say face. And Bob talked about how the face looks. That's right. That would be right. But the reason they're trying to get away from the face in his presence is because he's pure holiness. And the people at the great white throne are pure evil. But they can't get away. Do you know why they can't get away? Because they made a choice. If you wind up at the great white throne, you have made a choice to be there. In fact, I would say this to you. If you wind up at the great white throne, you go, oh, you go there over the dead body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Besides that, there's no place to run and hide. If you know your name's not written in the, land, in the book of life today, there's a place to run. It's called Jesus. It's called Calvary. And he's got his arms open wide, just like that Father, in Luke chapter 15, and he's running towards you because he wants to save you. He wants you not to be here. It's the picture. The people who were there, in biblical language, are lost people. There are people who are without Christ. They are people who have never chosen to follow Jesus. The only way to get your name in this book of life and to avoid the great white throne is to receive Jesus' offer of salvation, to accept Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord, to understand that he died for you in your place, to understand that the blood washes over you and can wash your sin away. And here's what I want to say to you, brothers and sisters. Five seconds after you are dead, five seconds after Jesus returns, your fate will be sealed. If you're in this crowd, it will be too late. The people here have but one eternity. I I want you to think about that. The people here are going to wind up in a place in that lake of fire. But I want you to think about it. Consider this with me. Why in the world... Would Jesus allow someone into his heaven who hated his church, hated his people, didn't want to hang out with them, found it miserable to be in worship? Why would Jesus let somebody like that into heaven? Because I'm just going to tell you, it's my thought that when somebody doesn't want to be a part of God's people and hear God's word and worship the King of Kings, Heaven will be their own personal hell if God were to let them get, go there. They've already made their choice. The people at the great white throne have no hope. They've rejected Jesus. They refuse to receive Jesus. And thus they have received and are receiving 
their reward. I kind of want to drive this home because your reward is what you work for. Your reward is what your life brings you. Not only at the great white throne, but here. Let me just share a story with you. It's back from the 90s. I heard a youth evangelist tell our kids this story. It seems there was a senior, a girl who was a senior in high school. Boy, she had spent her life in the youth group. She spent her life singing. She spent her life in Bible study. And that's her senior year of spring, and her and her mom and dad are in real conflict because she thinks that she's old enough. She feels that she's old enough to go off to Florida on spring break by herself. Her mom and dad don't question her, but maybe question the environment, but they really got into a tussle. And finally, the parents acquiesced bought a ticket for her to go down into Florida to enjoy spring break. She arrived, checked in. After she got checked in, she went out to where they were partying out on the patio, having a good time. She found a guy. They danced. They ate partying, having a good time. Then they drank a little alcohol. That was kind of out of her style, but she did it because she didn't want to be seen as a fuddy-duddy. They spent the evening just having a good time, and then as the night crept on, they wound up in her hotel room where he spent the night. Now, they had partied hard and long, and so she was late waking up the next morning. And when she woke, he was gone. She got up to look in the bathroom. He was not there. But there was a beautiful little wrapped present on the counter there. And the note on the outside said, I really enjoyed last night. And she unwrapped it. And she found another little note inside, and what was inside was a little miniature coffin. And the note said, Welcome to the world of AIDS. In our political structure today, we say decisions have consequences. Here's what I'm going to tell you in your physical life and in your spiritual life. Decisions have consequences. The people at the throne were people who had made a decision and they were about to receive the reward for their decision. Which brings us to the, the picture of the people that brings us to the place. There's no way to soften this, and I really don't want to. Brother Jerry, you're trying to scare us to get us out of hell? Boy, if I could scare you to get out of hell, I'd do it right now. Because it's called, three times there, it's called the lake of fire. It's a place where the beast and Satan and the false prophet are. It was designed for them. It wasn't designed for you. But because of the evil in the world, and because we've been effect, infected with that evil, we will only escape if our name is in the book. Your name does not get to be in the book by attending church. Your name does not get to be in the book just because you get baptized. Your name does not get in the book just because you do good and your good outweighs your bad. Your name gets in the book not because you just pray a prayer, 
Your name is in the book when you receive his offer of salvation and you follow him with all you are. You will seek and find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. Today, I pray that if anybody in this room knows that your name is not written in the book, I pray today that you will fix that. He stands. He pleads. He begs. Come to me. Let's pray together.